remember Monday? You know, it's been a long week when, 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 when you know, just a few days ago it was like 50 degrees warmer. You know, it's been a long week when you're tired and when you're wore out and all you want to do is lay in bed. You know, it's been a long week when all you can think about is all the difficult things that you've walked through, all the struggles, all the turmoil, all the difficulties, all the hurts. You know it's been a long week when it's hard to remember the good that maybe just happened a few moments before. It's been a long week. I don't know about you, but, but, but those weeks that, are, that come along that are long, they tend to, tend to drag me down a little bit. They tend to, tend to have this effect on me where, where I, I, I feel a little hopeless. I know I have hope. I know I, I live in hope. I know I, I have a, a hope in Christ. But I know that sometimes those weeks, they come along. And, and there's no doubt that you've been in a war all week. There's been no doubt that you've been struggling and battling all week. Sometimes it's the, the war on the outside that you're dealing with, people and struggles and difficulties. And a lot of times, it's the war within. A lot of times... It's an inside job that you're struggling with. It's a, it's a self-treason. It's a self-sabotage that you're dealing with. Well, this morning we'll talk a little bit about the war within. And to, to kind of set it up this morning, I want to I recount for you a famous story from history. I don't know if you are, are very aware of this or not, but there's this account of the battle for Troy. Troy was this, this city that, uh, that sat on, on the uh, Asia Minor coastline, and, and the Greeks came over to do battle against the city of Troy, and, and there's all these reasons why they battled, but the thing we need to concentrate on this morning is there was a battle, and there was a siege, and the, the Greek army was, was camped outside the city of Troy, and the, the people of Troy were, were bunkered inside the city, and, and, and the siege went on and back and forth, and it seemed as if it were hopeless. There would be no movement forward, and, and the Greeks, they thought to themselves, well, to end this siege and to win the war, what we will do is we will trick the citizens of Troy. And so what they did, you remember what happened? Some of you know. What happened? They, 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 they built this, this, this horse, this great wooden horse, and they left it outside the city gates, and they withdrew. They, they, they seemingly ran away. They left the siege, and they, 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 they moved back away from a posture of, of offense toward the city of Troy. And the, the citizens of Troy saw that the Greek army had left, and they left behind this trophy, this, this, this Trojan horse. They left it behind, and the people of Troy thought to themselves, we win, we win. And not only do we win, and the army of the Greeks are gone, but, but they left behind this, this, this valuable treasure, this trophy, this, this Trojan horse that we know it by today. And so they, they, they brought the horse through their gates. They opened the gates up, they brought the horse in through the gates, and they, they left it there inside, and they celebrated. And as night descended, what happens next? The Greek soldiers that were hidden inside that wooden horse, they came out and they opened the gates for the full Greek army to come in and they came in and they captured the city of Troy. Now a lot of times we, we, we are told that story or we're reminded of that story to, to help us think about not to be tricked, not to be fooled by things that are too good to be true, not to, not to, not to always look at a, at a gift in, in a fashion that is beneficial to us. See, the people of Troy, they willingly brought their own death into their city. What seemed to be a gift actually turned out to be their destruction. I think it's a lesson for us to learn as we begin our, our story, our, our, our conversation, our scripture reading this morning. There's, a, there's an account there that helps us understand that we need to understand that we are living in times of battle, in times of war. And instead of remaining faithful to the battle that we're in against our own sin, too many times we think we've won and we invite the very thing into our lives that will destroy us. You see, there is a war and you have an adversary. But daily, what you do is battle against yourself. Daily, you struggle and you fight against yourself. There is not a devil behind every bush. The devil does not make you do anything. In fact, what the devil does is he presents you with opportunities. He presents you with Trojan horses. But he does not make you 
do anything. You're not fighting the devil. You're fighting you. You don't want no part of him. That's God's job. Stick with the job that you have to fight the sin in your life. That's what you're fighting for. Your desires, your sin, your intent, your misguided thoughts, your capacity to, to think that you can control events and time and people and places and emotions. James gives us a, a glimpse into understanding this, this, this blame factor that sometimes that we often want to do. Sometimes we want to blame our sin on something or someone else. If you open your Bibles up, I invite you to look real quick at James chapter 1, just a few verses there as we get into our message this morning. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, James tells the church, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, it is fully grown. It brings forth death. See, like the Trojan horse, we desire things. We like to take them for ourselves. We take actions. We take thoughts. We take relationships. And we bring them in to our house, into our lives. Instead of taking them captive and destroying them for what they are, we bring them home as trophies, adding them to our lives, putting them on shelves, sometimes even of honor in our own hearts and our lives. And I know what we say when we do these kinds of things. Well, I'm, 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 I just, I just I want to I keep this, this thing around a little while. I wanna, it it, it looks, looks good on the shelf over there. It's, 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 I'm, just, I'm just weak, and it reminds me of, 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 of you, know, you know how we are. We, we have these things in our lives that we don't destroy, but we know that will destroy us. And we treat them like, like trophies, almost like this Trojan horse, not, not realizing or not admitting to the danger that's really there. And when we start to realize a little bit of the danger, we start assigning blame. We start trying to attribute the temptation in our lives to other people, other situations, and even to God. See, what we think today is not unique to us. It's been thought for years. James teaches the church, God is not to blame for the sin in your life. You are. And that's where we have to begin this morning. We have to own up. We have to accept responsibility for what is truly in our lives. That's where we have to begin today, church. We've got to own up to the fact that there is sin in our lives. It's not just a weakness. It's wickedness. And there is a difference. Because weakness can be excused away. Wickedness, however has to be dealt with and crushed in order for you to move forward and live out as you must. Live out as the family that God wants you to be, as the person, as the man, the woman, as the employee, as the boss, as the missionary, as the church. We've got to destroy, destroy that. We have to establish, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we can see three things real quick, really easy. God does not tempt us. Therefore, God is not the one who causes our sin. The second thing is, it's our desire. It's our desire. We're, we are lured and enticed by our own desire. And the third thing that we see, what happens when we take action on those desires? When we're lured into that trip, what happens? We get, we get sucked in, and, and sometimes we get sucked in so far we can't escape. And what does that, what does that lead to? It says that, that sin, it conceives and it gives birth to sin in our lives, and that brings death. And we have to accept, we have to deal with the fact that we are, in fact, to blame for the sin in our lives. Nobody else put it there. You, that, that's a hard thing for us to come, to come to grips with sometimes. Nobody put your sin in your life but you. You know that? It wasn't, the, the devil didn't make you do it. God didn't make you do it. It's your sin. And we have to own that. We have to realize the wickedness instead of the weakness that we're living in. This morning, as, as we walk through this, I want you to stop for just a moment. I want you to stop and, and consider. Consider your Trojan horse. I want you to, to think about that for a second. What's that, what's that prize? What's that trap that's in your life? What's that, that thing that you don't want to quite let go of, but you don't really think it bothers anybody or hurts anyone? What's that, that secret sin? What's that obvious sin? What's that blatant 
place where you are disobedient to God. Because until we have an attitude that we want to firmly and fully crush the sin in our lives, we will not be fully effectively the person that God calls us to be. We can't be the dad to our kids that we need to be. We can't be the mom. We can't be the husband, the wife. We can't be the person, the friend that someone needs to be. We can't truly and fully live out our mission and our calling in life until we crush it, until we take an attitude that we want to crush it. We just don't want to keep it around, put it on a shelf, and look at it and, and bring it up from time to time. We've got to decide that it's wickedness and not just a weakness. We can't just excuse it away. We can't just pass blame somewhere else. There is an enemy within, church, and it must be crushed. Otherwise, it will destroy you. It will destroy us. Sin is a trap. You are your own enemy as you do battle against yourself because you, you are the greatest salesperson ever to yourself. Do you know that? You can talk yourself into anything. You can justify it. You can, you can decide that you can do this because it does this because you want that. You can you could even decide that your sin is so good for you because it helps somebody else. You can sell yourself sin like nobody can. But see, sin, sin is a trap. Sin tells you it doesn't hurt anyone. It tells you that no one knows. It tells you that there's no collateral damage. It tells you that you can do it just one more time. It tells you you deserve it. It tells you it's a reward. It tells you you're really a good person, or at least better than the next person. You see, it tells you that you're better than them. It tells you that forgiveness is overrated. It tells you that you can play now and pay later. It tells you you can stop any time. It tells you that, you, that only one more look can't hurt a thing. It tells you that it can really ease your pain. It tells you that you're winning without sacrificing. You see, sin, it tells you that it's somebody else's fault. That's what sin does. That's the trap of sin. That's the, the Trojan horse that we invite into our lives that really invites destruction. And I can tell by the astonished looks on your face, this is a revelation that's coming to you for the very first time. I can tell by looking at you, you've never even thought about sin in this way. You've, you've always thought that sin is somewhere else, certainly not inside of you, but sin, it is inside of us. It's that war that we do against the flesh. It's been there since the beginning in the garden, and we fight against our flesh every day. Paul speaks to the church at Rome in chapter 6, as well as us today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up, turn them on. It's Romans chapter 6. As we walk through, we see Paul addressing this church and helping them understand that the, the sin, the, the issues, the things that they're walking through, it's not just a damage for them, but it's a damage for the church as a whole. And that they must take seriously the calling that they receive. They must take seriously the grace that God has given them. They must take seriously the sin in their lives. So as we begin, Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, because that's what sin does. It makes you obey. See, that's, that's another little lie, another little trap of sin. It thinks, it makes you think that you're in control, that you've got this. You don't. When you are struggling with sin, it is your master. You obey it. That draw, that pull, that passion. You, you're pulled in, you're drawn in. Verse 13, do not present your, your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. See, here's good news, folks. There's good news. Grace is all kinds of good news. God gives grace to Christ's followers. He gives us life. See, he, where we deserve death, he gives life. And he gives freedom. Grace covers sin. So verse 15 goes on. So what then? What then, church? Because obviously you understand that you're a Christ follower. You're understanding you're following Jesus. You understand grace, but yet you are still dealing with sin. So, verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. We're not to continue sinning because we're covered by grace. We're to fight daily against sin. 
We're not just to, to allow it to, to camp outside our lives and bring it in from time to time like that Trojan horse. We're to fight it daily. We've been saved from it. Act like it. See, see grace is not a, a get-out-of-sin-free card because I know many of us think that. We think grace is a get-out-of-sin-free card to be played every five seconds, but it's not. So many of us, we, we, we use it as an excuse to sin, not a release from it. Did, did you hear me? Grace is not an excuse to sin. It's the release from it. So let go. And every one of you right now are probably thinking that same song. Let it go. Let it go. See, too many of us, we don't have that problem where, where sin still bothers us. Verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one who you obey? You are the slaves of the one you obey. Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. I love when, when, when people in the Bible start talking this way because I know they're talking to me. Because they get all lofty with some words from time to time, but then they kind of bring it down to, to moron level. See, he, he's, he's talking to us, and he's trying to bring it down to a level that we understand. And, 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 and we have natural limitations, don't we? I mean, I mean I'm, I'm looking at the natural. No, I mean, seriously. We have these natural limitations. And, and, and Paul is telling us in no uncertain terms, guys, here's the deal. Here's the deal. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? What good has ever come from your sinfulness? What good has ever come from your sinfulness? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me sum up what Paul says here. God says that we deserve sin for our death. We deserve death for our sin, but what we get is life with Christ. So we have to live with the perspective of constantly celebrating our freedom while staying vigilant against the dangers, the sin, the destruction that once marked our lives for death. You see, we don't need to bring the Trojan horses into our house. They don't belong there. It will only cause destruction. Let me paint the picture a little differently. If today, if today that you were diagnosed with cancer, what do you think would happen? If today that, that, that you, 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 you were in the, seeing the doctor and, and, and you went through the process and at the end of the day they said, you have cancer, do you, do you think the staff, the medical folks, would they take an aggressive stance against that, that cancer? Would, 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 they, would they, they look at you and say, here is the deal. We have to eradicate cancer from your life. Otherwise, it will kill you. That's exactly what they're going to tell you. They're going to go in and they're going to take drastic, aggressive measures to rid your body of cancer. Not only would they attack the cancerous cell, but likely they would cut a perimeter around the cancerous cells, taking out even good cells that may have even bumped up against the bad cells at some point in time. Because just one, just one cancer cell, what does that mean? It means death. It means death. And so, so there's a complete and total annihilation they want to get rid of it. They want to remove that completely from your life, leaving nothing to chance. They don't want to get rid of most of it. Have you ever heard a doctor says, hey, you know what we'd like to do with your cancer is we'd like to get rid of most of it. Do you think, has anybody ever said that? We want to get rid of most of it. Or, or, or we want to get rid of some of it. Um, well, hey, why don't we leave just a little bit for a souvenir for you later on? Why, why, don't, why don't we leave a little piece of cancer for a trophy that you can brag about to your friends later? So you can, you can, you can take it out and show it around. I mean, seriously, th th does a doctor ever say anything like that? No. They want to get rid of it. 
They don't want to wait and see what happens because it's death. They want to get rid of cancer. You see, God, God is the doctor, and he's telling each and every one of us that, that, that sin is death. He says, you have cancer, but you know what we want to believe? Not me. God, God, I mean, God, you are right. I have this tumor in my body. God, you are absolutely correct, but, but I think it's really just a benign cyst. God says, nope, malignant cancer. That's what he says. And, 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 and the, the process is a little different between a, a benign cyst and a malignant cancer, right? I mean, you still want to get rid of it, but, but, but you know, one's really, really bad, and, and one's just, uh, it's okay, it's inconvenient. We like to think of the sin in our lives more of as, as an inconvenience. We like to think of it more as a weakness instead of wickedness. You, you see the difference, right? We have, a, we, have a, have a, we have to have a posture. We have to posture against the wickedness. See, we have a problem. We don't want to deal with the sin in our lives, the enemy within, seriously. So many of us, we, we treat our sin like it's no big deal. We treat it like it's, it's innocent. Dude, it is death. Sin is death. Cut it out. Destroy the horse. Quit playing with it. But that's what we do. Our sin. We kind of we think we can put it on a string and pull it out of our pocket whenever we want to and play with it and look at it and even show it around sometimes. Or sometimes we can hide it real well and stick it real deep, but we keep our finger attached to it because we know where it is. It gives us a sense of comfort, a sense of pleasure. It's not a weakness, church. It's wickedness. It is cancerous. It will destroy me and you. There's an enemy within. It is you. And you must make war daily. It's not just I'm weak. It's not just that's my Achilles heel. It's not just the stone or the burden I carry. I've heard and said all those things, and I believe probably you have too. Our problem is that we wallow in our weakness rather than make war on our wickedness. We wallow in our weakness rather than make war on our wickedness. If you agree with that, shake your head like this. There's not nearly enough of you shaking your head like this. Guys, we cannot wallow in our weakness. We have to make war in our wickedness. And for some of us this morning, we are coming face to face for the very first time that we are, in fact, wicked. Now, as Christians, as Christ followers, we have grace. And grace covers sin. Grace allows us freedom in Christ. Grace allows us to, to, to live not tied down by the sin in our lives, but allows us to live freely, released from that sin. Let it go. Let it go, church. What good is it really doing you? Give you a little comfort give you a little pleasure for a moment, give you a little guilt, give you a little jealousy. Do those things really help us out in the long run? Our problem is we wallow in our weakness rather than make war on our wickedness. See, we have, we have these great excuses for why we do what we do, don't we? Don't we? we say things like, well, you know how I am, or, or you know how she is, or how he is. You know, we, 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 we had a rough life. Right? We, had a, we had a rough life, so we, we excuse away what we do. Or, or how about this one? We have issues. Right? Raise your hand, don't, if you have issues. Past bad choices lead us to make continual bad choices, right? That's, that's, that's an excuse that we have because it's a pattern and we can't break the pattern because, you know, whatever. I didn't know. Ignorance is bliss, right? Or is ignorance really just no excuse? Maybe you had good intentions. Maybe good intentions. Maybe. Doubt it. But may, maybe, maybe your intentions were good when you pursued that thing, that sin in your life. But see, things change. Things change. They always change. You see, we like to be considered mistakers and not sinners. I made a mistake rather than I sinned. No, I, th I think what happens is we, 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 we have accidents, but we still sin. See, a mistake, a mistake is a little different. A mistake means you're probably playing with fire, and you mishandled it. 
An accident, sometimes stuff just happens. I get that. But a mistake is different. So don't, don't, don't confuse the two. We are, in fact, not mistakers, church. We sin. We do it. It's not a weakness. It is wickedness. It's not benign. It's cancerous. We've got to cut it out. We've got to let it go. We've got to destroy the horse. That's what we have to do. We have to flee from temptation. But so often we like to, like to keep sin close thinking that we can control it. We think that, that we, can, we, can, we, can, we can handle it. We have to separate ourselves from sin. We have to separate ourselves because here's the deal. When you hold on to sin, when you hold on to the sin in your life, what you're saying is you are powerful enough to control it. Remember what the Bible says? It says you are a slave to whatever controls you. You're a slave to your sin when you have sin in your life. When you don't treat it as the wickedness that it is, when you just treat it as a weakness. You become a slave to that weakness that you say, which is in fact wickedness. You think you can handle your rage. You think you can handle your resentfulness. You think you can handle your addiction. You think you can handle your fill in the blank. The key word in all that is your. Because your is how we think about it. We think of our sin as kind of like a pet. We think we can just kind of keep it around and we feed it a little bit from time to time. We play with it from time to time. We get a little pleasure from it from time to time. But the deal is this. If we think it's a pet, it's kind of like having a lion as a pet. It's a wild animal. And what does a wild animal do? It destroys you. Why? Because it can. That's how we treat sin. We think we can control it. We think, we think our sin is kind of like, kind of like this bridge. We think that we can, we can cross over any time we want to and be safe. We think we can just go back and forth, back and forth. Our sin's over here, here we, we sneak over here a little bit. Sometimes what we do this, sometimes we think, well, you know, the access to that is too easy, too easy, and, and I don't, I don't want to be tempted. So, so, so we, 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 replace, we replace our bridge with, with a smaller bridge, right? A little smaller bridge, and, 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 and then, we, then we go back and forth on the, on the smaller bridge, and, 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 and then, well, you know, that bridge is not, you know, I'm, I need a little more access. I need, I need, a, I need a four-lane road, so, so we go back to what? We go back to the bigger bridge, right? But we always, we always have this access back and forth on the bridge, back and forth. When we take sin seriously, when we treat it for the wickedness that it is instead of the weakness that we have, what happens? We've got to flee from it. We have to remove the access. We have to blow up the bridge. We've got to burn the bridge down. We've got to get rid of it. But, you know, we don't even like those words, do we? Burn the bridge. Because everybody tells us when you burn bridges, that's bad, right? Because you don't have options. You don't have a way back, a way out. Do you trust God or do you trust yourself? Burn the bridge. Tear it down. When you can't go there no more, you can't go there no more. How do you flee the devil? How do you resist the devil? You remove the access. And the Bible tells us when we resist the devil, what does he do? He flees from us. Not because of you and how awesome you are, although I think you're pretty awesome. He flees from you because the power of God within you has burst forth and has destroyed the bridge that gave you access to the continued sin that was in your life. You have freedom from that sin through the blood of Jesus Christ because of grace. We have freedom from sin, but we've got to let it go. We've got to burn down, tear down the bridges. We can't just keep a little bit of access. Because I, I know how you are. I'm the same way. I want I want I want I want I want a little bit of access. I want, a, I want a little sliver of access. I want, I, want a, I want to cover my bases in case I need to go there again. We make really great excuses, don't we, for our sin? We make really good justifications for, for why we go and why we do and why we say and who we're there with. We make great excuses. But at the end of the day, that's what they are. They're excuses. They're excuses. You see, we don't really want an escape route nearly as much as we want an excuse, do we? Church. Our sin, the enemy within us, it will destroy us if we don't take it seriously. It's not just a weakness. It's wickedness. Let's call it what it is. Let's name the name.
because you know we're we're a lot more comfortable hanging around weakness than we are wickedness, aren't we? Destroy it. Destroy it. Burn it down. Remove it from your life. In World War II, history tells us that as the Germans were were retreating back to Berlin, as the Allied forces came for them, one of the last things that they wanted to do was to to destroy the bridges. But in the end, they did destroy the bridges because they thought that would slow the Allies down. They, they had the, the concept right. They wanted to remove themselves from their enemies, so they destroyed the bridges. But sometimes they didn't get around to destroy those bridges until it was too late. In our own lives, we're like that too. We know that we have a problem on that bridge. We know that we have access to sin. We know that we need to remove those bridges, but we don't. You know why? Because we love the bridge almost as much as we love the sin. Because we, we're vested in that bridge. We, we, we built that bridge. We have history on that bridge. We own that bridge. And it hurts us to think that we have to destroy something that's ours. See, those Trojans, when they brought that, that gift, that trophy into their, their presence, they, they thought to themselves, wow, this is for us. It's mine. We're going we're gonna to glory in, 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 in having this trophy that we can put on display because we are the victors is a trap it's a trap church destroy the bridges we have to confess our weakness because when we just hang around on the weakness it just allows us to make excuses confess your weakness it lets you make excuses but when you confess your wickedness it lets you make war when you have a vested interest not only in your survival but you're thriving as you live forward you will go to extreme measures You will cut out the cancer. You will destroy the horse and you will burn and tear down the bridges, the access. You see, you and I, we're not just weak. You've heard the the, the saying, you know, the spirit is willing. The spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. It's an excuse, folks. It's an excuse. You have the power within you to resist the devil and his temptations. At the end of the day, you have to decide who's stronger. Is God stronger, or are you stronger? It's not the devil that makes you do it. It's you. It's you. It's me. I'm the one that does it. You're the one that does it. We've got to burn the bridge, cut out the cancer, destroy the horse. We've got to quit blaming our weakness and deal with our wickedness. We have to make war on sin. See, our sin is our sin. We're used to it. We're comfortable with it. It gives us pleasure. But it is death. It will kill you. It will kill you. Jesus, he died so that your sin can be put to death. You can't do it on your own. But God sent Jesus so that he would, so that he could, so that he will. See, that's the gospel. That's the good news. God sent Jesus to die for sinners so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And church, here's here's even more good news. We don't make war on our own. We're all here. We're all battling. We all may have different sin, but we're all on the same side. Alone is nowhere to be when you're in battle. You can count on your church to stand beside you, to hold you accountable, to remind you that it's wickedness. It's not weakness. What we're seeking, what we're living for, is freedom, not an excuse. You may fight on your own, but knowing that you have people fighting on your side that are in your corner, that have gone through what you're going through, it gives you hope. It gives you a reminder that God is great and God is good, and we get to make war together, church. Too often, we won't live in the victory that Jesus has won for us. Too often, we wallow in the wickedness. Too often, we just think it's weakness. Too often, we'd rather be respectable failures than responsible victors. People want respectability way more than they want victory. People want to be seen a certain way rather than be victorious completely and utterly. You have to ask yourself, do you want victory? Do you want responsibility more 
Who do you want respectability? We have to wage war. Not just on what we call weakness, but what in fact is wickedness. We have to own the internal issues that work to sabotage our fight. We have to stop treating wickedness as just a weakness. We have to present ourselves to the Spirit so that He can help us overcome those weaknesses, that wickedness. We have to acknowledge our wretchedness, embrace our holiness, and live in righteousness. That's what we must do, church. We have to make war, and winning means taking responsibility, not making excuses. Some of you today, you came and you felt the effects of war because it's been a long week. You felt the effects of war and the war has been beating you up. And you may think that the tide is turning and you are losing. You're hurt and you're discouraged. Do you know that a discouraged army, a discouraged army as it enters battle, there's the certainty of defeat. The church, we are an army, in fact, and we're on the same side and we're fighting arm in arm, hand in hand. We have our own battles, but we're in the same war. Here's hope. Jesus is in that war with you. He's in that battle with you. The church stands strongest when it stands together. We're standing together making war against the wickedness, the evil, the sin. This morning as we we close our worship time today, I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to come to the altar this morning as as the band plays. We'll have an extended time of worship here in just a moment. There's there's plenty of time for you to to make a decision. To make a decision if you need to come today and and you need, need to confess something to God, come. Make that confession. If you need to come and be comforted today, come. Bring somebody with you or or tap somebody and say, I need you to pray for me. Pray with me. If you need to come for someone else, I invite you to come. Let God show you and teach you and guide you this morning in your response. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make war. It's not just a weakness in our lives. It's wickedness that we face. We have to make war. Some of you may, may need to pray for someone today. Some of you need to have someone pray with you. Our elders, our staff, if you need to grab somebody, we're here. We're available. We want to pray for you. We want to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're realizing that you need to destroy that Trojan horse. You need to tear down that bridge, that access. Maybe that's you this morning. You need to spend these next moments confessing to God what that is, where that is, how that is. You need to repent. You need to turn from your sin and turn to God. You need to live in the freedom that he's granted you through Jesus Christ. And maybe today, maybe today for the very first time, you're going to respond to that call that Jesus has on your life. That beckoning that God has been doing in your heart and your mind. Maybe today is going to be that day where where you decide enough's enough. You're going to call it quits on this sin life and you want to follow Jesus and give your heart to him want to step into his arms saved and free from sin maybe that's you today I invite you to make that firmly clear in your own heart in your own mind maybe it's where you're sitting maybe it's down front maybe it's with somebody maybe it's all alone God's word tells us if we will call upon his name he will answer us if we call upon Jesus he will save us from the sin that we're in saves us to a life that is complete because we have to stay constantly constantly on guard for that sin creeping in. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not weakness. It is in fact wickedness. We can't hang on to bridges and horses as trophies and escape routes because all it turns into is an excuse. This morning, God, we love you. We thank you. God, work in hearts and minds this morning, setting firmly a foundation of truth and love. God, help us each and every one as we're dealing with the sin in our lives. God, to first call it what it is, and God, to decide that we're going to turn from it. We're going to fight it. We're going to rebuke it. Father, you give us the strength and the courage and the power. God, you give us the boldness to stand. Father, this morning, 